welcome to this uh, webinar um, within the webinar series of the o OECD UNEP Global PFC Group. So we have a webinar uh, series on PFASs, um, and the the focus on, of the group uh, is really to support uh, the SICAM resolutions on uh, shifting to safer alternatives uh, for PFAS. So you're welcome also to um, view previous uh, webinars that we've had. We have the recordings on the uh, on, um, on the OECD uh, PFAS website, and uh, certainly the Secretariat. Um, would look for any suggestions uh, from you as well as to future uh, webinar uh, topics. So uh, we have you all on mute today. Uh, there's uh, we had about 250 people register, which is great. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone will join in, but um, that's super uh, if they do. Um, so today I'd really like to uh, welcome uh, two representatives from uh, Gore, uh, Joe Carlin and John Hammerschmidt, and they'll be uh, talking uh, to us, uh, discussing with us um, the the journey that Gore has been on in in terms of finding alternatives to per and polyfluoroalkyl substances of concern and what some of the the challenges they've had and, and the continuing challenges. So uh, really welcome their participation today uh, in order to uh, share uh, their their learnings uh, with, with everyone else. So we'll have about a 45 minute presentation and then about 10 to 15 minutes for uh, questions after that. So I'll turn things over uh, to Joe uh, Carlin, who will start us off. Joe, please go ahead. All right, just checking if you can hear me okay. Yes, perfectly. All right, thank you. Uh, so, so thanks. Uh, my name is Joe Carlin. I'm a member of Gore's Global Floor Materials Platform. So it's a focus on the global supply chain. And I'm also a member of our Enterprise Floor Materials Stewardship Team. And I've been at Gore for over 21 years, developing expanded PTFE membranes and protective fabrics and industrial applications, and ensuring that the floor polymers that we purchase for the enterprise meet our technical requirements and also a focus on the stewardship of these floor materials. So today, we want to go through a brief introduction to Gore, and then I'm going to talk about the PTFE transition from the legacy polymerization processing aids. So I'll go through an overview of the PTFE, and then the motivation, challenges, and the results of that work. John will be speaking to the development of alternative water repellent textile coatings. Some of the audience might not be familiar with W.L. Gore and Associates. We were founded in 1958 by Bill and Vee Gore in the basement of their home as an entrepreneurial venture. It was built on the belief that the new polymer could provide high value to society. And they also had a vision of how the company could be organized to best utilize the talents of each person in that venture or enterprise. And today we've grown to over 10,500 associates. Uh, we refer to our employees as associates which emphasize everybody shares in the success of the enterprise. And our annual revenues are around $3.7 billion. And we remain privately held so we can focus on the long-term payoff rather than short-term gain. So our 60 years of research and expanded fluoropolymers is the core of our technical capability and our fundamental understanding of the properties of PTFE-based uh, materials help us with the thousands of products that we are able to produce to change outcomes for people around the world. So one of our core values at Gore is our commitment to delivering products that meet our customer expectations and are fit for their intended end use. And this sounds kind of like a simple premise, but it differentiates us from our competitors because of our deep commitment to use sound science and fundamental understanding of our products to ensure that we can live up to this standard and stand behind our products. So pictured on this slide is our enterprise divisional organization showing the fabrics, medical products, and performance solutions divisions. And below each division is a representation of the products enabled by our material understanding so I'm part of a group that's called Core Technology that produces the PTFE 
powder and, trans, and transits it into the intermediates to make all of our products. And what we're probably best known for our Gore-Tex fabric, we make medical devices used in the treatment of cardiovascular disease, filter bags that capture mercury and dioxin from air emissions, and also some important components in fuel cell technology. These are just a few examples of the products that leverage the properties of PTFE and other fluoropolymers. So as I was saying, we've got deep understanding and we can tailor the PTFE to make expanded PTFE that have various structures based on the application, such as high and low density, tight or open porosity, thinness or thickness, um, strength orientation, and multiple geometries. And it comes in many forms, including tapes, membranes, films, sheets, rods. And we apply various proprietary modifications to produce these highly valuable products. And since discovering the expanded PTFE, like I said, we call it EPTFE in 1969, Gore developed products using the combination of this EPTFE and complementary material science expertise so we can have a good understanding of the application requirements. And with each new application, we're delivering some materials that improve lives. So a quick overview of PTFE. Uh, so PTFE is polytetrafluoroethylene. Um, it's the most common fluoropolymer used by Gore. And it's a simple structure. It's a carbon backbone with fluorine attached directly and it's a very large molecular weight, um, estimated to range from hundreds of thousands to millions of Daltons. And so the type of uh, PTFE that we use is called fine powder. So it's uh, pictured on that top uh, image there. It's a fine white powder and it's polymerized using a process that requires a polymer processing aid. So this is where the uh, PFAS uh, of concern enter the supply chain. And so for Gore, prior to 2015, our suppliers used PFOA and then transitioned to something else after that. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So this polymer is what we use to make our products. Another version of PTFE is called an aqueous dispersion. It's a suspension of the same PTFE particles in a water-based mixture. And so it uses the same polymerization route. It does use the PPA as well. And it's used for coating different articles. And finally, the third version of PTFE is called granulated powder. It's also known as molding powder. And it's made through a different polymerization process that does not require that polymerization processing aid. And so it has its own unique market, but for Gore, it is something that does not uh, fit with our needs. We cannot make expanded PTFE articles with this type of PTFE. So typically, PTFE and other fluoropolymers have not been the focus of regulatory restriction efforts like those being applied to PFAS of concern. This was demonstrated in a peer-reviewed article that PTFE satisfies the OECD consensus criteria for a polymer of low concern. So now I'd like to talk about the transition from the historical use of PFOA into the alternatives for the fine powder PTFE. So in 2006, the US EPA uh, started a voluntary storage program and invited eight manufacturers of floor materials to reduce the PFOA emissions by, 20, by 95 percent before 2010 and then virtually eliminate them by 2015. So Gore was not the manufacturer of PTFE, but participated as a processor. As you can see, the significance of this change would impact all the products made by Gore. And so the connection between Gore and this transition was the trace residual PPA presence in that purchased PTFE, which is then further reduced in our processing. This transition would be really disruptive to the industry. If you think about it, there's been 50 years of operating and experience and optimization, and now a new technology would have to be used and redevelop all the PTFE fine powder grades. So here we see a timeline that shows the regulatory progress of PFAS concern in the top section with Gore's investments and initiatives below the dashed line. 
The board established initiative to address safety, health, and environmental needs that continuously improve our process. We voluntarily invested in better control technology for each process and plant that was processing PFAS of concern. When Gore suppliers transitioned to alternative polymerization aids, uh, we put together a cross-functional team to evaluate the alternatives to minimize Gore's associate exposure to the alternative polymerization aids, verify the effectiveness of our environmental controls, and also assure that any small residuals remaining in our products cannot affect the safety or performance of our products. So our, one of our uh, goals was to do product stewardship reviews. And so we employed our GORE technologists who assisted us with the transition to the PFOA replacements by using sound science and standard best practice for toxicological risk assessment. The bottom section is showing the products and how they've undergone changes related to this topic over time as well. So our transition from long chain to short chain chemistries began in the late 1990s and involved in new coding technologies for fabrics over the last two decades. And John will address this topic in his portion of the presentation. So although this diagram shows a finite ending to each of the blocks, um, I wanna stress that this is a journey and there's continuous improvement improvement efforts going on all the time in our manufacturing areas, support systems, and product fitness for use assessments. So I'll focus on the technical project related to the transition of the PPAs in the next section. So our uh, journey started with uh, assessment of and requirement that our PTFE performance for our future state had to match the original. And so to do that, we had to look at all the mechanical and thermal properties that were related to the PTFE. So if you remember the slide in the beginning with the divisional products, it's a large number of products shown. So the magnitude of this challenge was kind of demonstrated early on when we were trying to assess what we would have to accomplish and look at the quantity of products that we might have to undergo this retesting for the fitness for use for our markets. And so doing that, we mapped out um, the entire catalog of products that we used you know, by division to try to put this information into a spreadsheet to get a handle on the project scope. And what we learned was that Excel 2003 did not have an infinite number of rows. Um, it runs out at row 65,536. So we basically broke Excel. So using some other tools, we put the whole product portfolio together and realized that we had 95,000 parts to assess. And so to short, uh, shorten up that time frame for doing that assessment and evaluation, we had to find ways to really clearly identify the key attributes of the PTFE. And so we looked at it as an exercise to fingerprint the performance. And so to do that, we had to look at uh, de developing new techniques to do the analytical testing. So we developed some proprietary polymer testing models, and they were based on uh, well-known polymer tests, which is kind of shown in the graph at the top with a uh, stress strain curve, and how that translated into the shape at the bottom that would describe the actual things that we do with our standard PTFE technology into the microstructures that provide those attributes. And so the development cycle took many iterations, and although it reduced the amount of testing and qualification experiments necessary to prove the equivalence, numerous validations were still required to satisfy our product claims and our customer needs. But along the way, we also had to make sure that everything was uh, suitable for our process. And so we had to evaluate the engineering controls we had in place through the processing as well as our environmental controls to ensure that they were adequate for the replacement alternatives. And so at the end of this journey, we did successfully transition all of those products on time and without disruption. And so this took hundreds of associates to, to tackle this job. And because of this commitment to ensuring these products were gonna be uh, fit for use, we stopped doing a lot of innovation so that we could focus on this technical challenge and so during the nine years it took us to 
to transition from the early development stages of the PTFE available through the success of the GORE products, um, we spent a lot of hours not doing new product development. That came out, so the, the ray of sunshine through this, um, this change was we sure learned a lot more about how the pace process PTFE and relate that to the products and performance. And so we're able to use that knowledge that we learned to leverage into new product developments today. So that's the, the end of my section and I'll transfer over to uh, John for the conclusion of the presentation. So hello, uh, my name is John Hammerschmidt. I'm the uh, sustainability technical champion for Gore Fabrics Division. Um, as a matter of introduction, I've been a research scientist focusing on development of polymer polymeric materials and coatings for a little over 20 years, the last 10 being with Gore. Um, I'm currently leading the technical effort uh, to deliver on Gore Fabrics' goal for eliminating PFCs and environmental concerns from our fabrics consumer products. Um, today I'll be sharing some of our portions of this alternative materials development journey um, that we're on. And uh, the focus today will be specifically on our consumer products business. Um, to start out, I thought I would uh, show uh, some of our product form. Gore is an ingredient brand and we produce laminates. Uh, the laminate structure um, is a cross section right here. Um, there uh, potentially could be a backer or a lining. Then there's our, our Gore-Tex membrane, which is a, uh, provides the waterproofness um, and allows breathability of moisture vapor. Um, and on the top a layer is an outer material or an outer shell textile. Um, and that is treated with a durable water repellent. This allows for beading but also has uh, impacts on water waking, which has implications for comfort. In addition, we also have uh, different product forms, which are uh, gloves as well as shoes. Uh, so we do provide also inserts for both of these uh, product forms. Uh, Gore has um, a guarantee to keep you dry promise for our Gore-Tex uh, windproof, waterproof, and breathable products. Um, so we take fitness for use very seriously, assuring products will do what they say will do. Um, and if you are not completely satisfied with the waterproofness, windproofs, or breathability of these products, repair it, replace it, or refund it, uh, refund your purchase price. Um, also just a note here, um, I am providing some references on the bottom of several of these pages if you want more information. So here's two groupings of some consumer end uses. Um, the first is what we refer to as general outdoor end uses. These are things like general hiking, camping, lift surf, uh, skiing, um, uh, urban exploration and rain, things like golf. Um, and we refer to these as general outdoor end uses. We also have another group of products uh, that are um, referred to as specialized outdoor, or internally, many times we refer to these as extreme and extended uh, end uses. These would be things like mountaineering, uh, free ride skiing, multi day trekking. Um, each collection is fit for use for the targeted end use um, and comes with our guarantee, guaranteed to keep you dry promise. So let's step into our goal to eliminate PFCs of environmental concern. As you see um, here, we use the term PFC. Um, throughout this uh, presentation, I, I will use uh, PFC terminology as opposed to per perfluorinated and perforated alkyl substance terminology. I'll use them interchangeably for the presentation. Um, PSC terminology has been adopted um, quite a bit in this industry, and I want to be also consistent with the language that we put together for our um, So let's start out with the definition of per and polyfluorinated compounds of environmental concern. Um, when we crafted the goal, we required uh, and wanted a clear definition to describe the materials that are in scope for elimination. Um, we wanted this to be clear for our internal developments, also with to be clear to our material suppliers and also our customers. Um, given the general you know, technical complexity of these definitions and acronyms in this space, uh, sometimes there can be confusion. Um, so uh, to be a PFC of environmental concern, a chemical uh, or material must exhibit all three of these traits. The first is highly fluorinated. I think that's self-explanatory, either per or polyfluorinated organic substances. The second is small enough to be bioavailable. 
so capable of crossing the cell membrane. Um, this, this is derived from the polymer of low concern phase, uh, framework, um, which sets a threshold of molecular weight of 1,000, um, and we added a, a factor of 3x to that. Uh, and finally, persistence, so half-life greater than two months. I'll also note that um, if, a, if a material is not itself a PFC of endocardial concern, but if it is, nonetheless, it should be considered one if it's shown to be a precursor. So let's step into the goal. Uh, in February 2017, we set ourselves uh, an ambitious goal to eliminate PFC's environmental concern uh, from the life cycle of our products. And this, this uh, came about in a two-step two initiative. Uh, the first key uh, milestone is by 2020, um, we will, uh, we're looking to eliminate 85% of our product units, uh, the life cycle of PFC's environmental concern from 85% of our units. Uh, and this includes jackets, shoes, gloves, and accessories. Um, the second um, initiative from this, uh, from the consumer uh, market, is between 21 and 23, Core Fabrics will remove the remaining, um, uh, the remaining TFC's environmental concerns from uh, our products. Um, I wish to highlight the life cycle aspect. So this is beyond just the product side. Uh, this goal encompasses both upstream into our supply chain as well as downstream to end of life. Um, to meet this goal, it requires development of new alternative materials uh, for our membranes and water repellent coatings. Uh, therefore, this is a significant effort to transition our products, uh, and it touches all of our products that we have. Um, I wish to also mention um, also, as we reported earlier this year, um, we're working very hard uh, to deliver against this 2020 goal, um, but we've had to accept that uh, innovation doesn't always go to schedule. Uh, and uh, we uh, have communicated to the marketplace that we will not meet at least the full goal of this 85% by 2020. Uh, but the progress we're making gives us confidence that we will meet this goal, albeit a little delayed. Um, just highlight a few of the other milestones within our goal. We spoke about the first uh, two aspects. Um, we're also introducing and have completed this uh, milestone, have achieved this milestone of uh, introducing a new DWR for the fall winter uh, 2018 season. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on uh, going forward, uh, talking in this presentation. Um, We've provided product labeling uh, as well to allow consumers to connect to Gore uh, Fabrics process, uh, progress. Um, we have a milestone for new EPTFE barriers made without using PFC's environmental concern as polymerization aids, as, as Joe mentioned earlier. Um, we also uh, have stated publicly that we are, we are exploring um, and actively pursuing complementary membrane materials um, and have focused our efforts in this, in this space. We have focused efforts here, um, but still significant technical work to do. Um, I'll allude to this a little bit later as well, but we have a parallel development uh, in DWR for some of the uh, more cha challenging technical uses. Um, we have recently completed a incineration study as well. Um, to evaluate representative municipal incineration conditions, um, and that and details of that uh, of that study um, have been published in Chemosphere uh, earlier this year. Uh, and finally, we have uh, standardized our hazard assessment approach. Um, we've completed that at the end of 2018, and going forward uh, in the future, we'll be looking to report against that as well. So now let me focus on um, one aspect of this, the remainder part, and it's uh, really towards uh, discussing uh, the efforts that it took to deliver on our 2018 uh, new DWR. I'm going to start with a little bit of background on uh, DWR, uh, then discuss some evaluation methods, and then a timeline of what was a multi-year development effort to give you some context of the, the challenge that we faced. So on the left, here in this image, I have a picture of a, a jacket here that uh, the DWR is not functional um, and is completely wet out. On the right, I have a picture of uh, a DWR that is functional, and you can see the, the visual aesthetic uh, beading that's, that's present. 
So without DWR, uh, the shell textile does wet out. Um, the fabric weight increases. Breathability decreases since it's, it's blocked by the water. And insulation is lost. Um, the loss of insulation really is uh, due to, without DWR, air is a very good insulator. Um, and in the face fabric, it's replaced by water. Water has a greater than 20x uh, higher thermal conductivity compared to air. And this translates to a rapid change in uh, local skin temperature. With DWR, um, obviously you'll see a visual aesthetic of the beading, it reduces water weight gain, uh, maintains that more warmth and improves comfort. And I was looking for a, a concise way of uh, summing up some of the details of the importance of DWR. And I actually found this a quote in a, a previous uh, review article. Uh, and basically sums it up well, I think. It's, Avoiding whiteout can be a comfort issue, uh, such as cycling or walking to work, but it can also be essential protection in more extreme conditions, especially when no shelter can be reached. Whiteout can cause significant cooling of the wearer, and under extreme conditions, this can be life-threatening. Here's a list of a number of criteria um, that are required uh, for um, uh, DWR uh, and that we consider during our development. So obviously, there's aspects of repellency, uh, water and or oil. Um, uh, so as far as initial uh, performance, but also uh, more importantly is the durability of this. So there can be different stresses that, that uh, can um, reduce the performance overall. Um, such as uh, we want to look at wash durability. So there can be contamination aspects uh, of detergents and other, other materials there, um, and also flex damage. Um, additionally, um, we look at field performance as well, which can um, uh, effectively stress and uh, challenges the DWR in many of its failure modes. Uh, there's comfort aspects, which I alluded to already. Um, one additional one beyond just the breathability or moisture transport uh, that DWR potentially could affect, there's also aspects of stiffness in hand. There's aesthetics and quality issues uh, in particular. Uh, there's a whole host of these. I'm just missing a few here. Um, color facets is one um, that basically in the, uh, characterizes the material's color resistance to fading or running. Uh, and finally, product stewardship. Uh, so Gore does use third-party standards. Um, so we've adopted OCATEX 100 standard as a, as a product safety standard, which requires all of our materials to be approved. In addition, our finished uh, fabric laminates undergo tests for harmful substances to ensure that finished textile laminates are safe to be worn from a chemical point of view. Um, also in 2010, all of Gore fabric manufacturing sites have been certified to comply with, this, with the blue sign system. Um, this is a comprehensive environmental and safety scheme uh, that's used in the textile industry. Uh, Blue Sign regularly revises their limits and usage bans for chemical substances, uh, and they publish these in the Blue Sign system sub uh, substance list. Uh, and finally, also, we do um, uh, utilize life cycle analysis, and on our webpage, we actually have several whole life cycle analyses of uh, some of our products, and we've also done one for DWR uh, in the past. Um, and we utilize this to understand also the, some of the impacts, uh, such as water and, and carbon footprint, in addition to the chemical footprint. All of those need to be uh, looked at holistically. So I think probably to this group, um, the material sets in here are, are quite familiar. Um, there's been discussions on these in the past, I believe. Um, so um, uh, traditional materials that have been used uh, in the past for uh, the, from the textile industry have been start out with the long, long side chain fluorinated polymers. So I'm showing here a homopolymer of the uh, fluoroacrylate material set. Uh, it does have a long chain on it. Um, Gore completed our uh, final elimination of uh, these materials from our functional fabrics at the end of 2013. So we are no longer using those materials. Um, our transition materials were into short side chain uh, fluorinated polymers, um, showing two different varieties, uh, commonly known in the industry as C6 or C4. Um, there are various versions of these. So again, I'm just showing a homopolymer, but there are copolymers of these materials, um, different aspects of these polymers uh, as well. And those changes uh, in the polymer uh, makeup can actually affect the DWR performance. So not, 
Not all, all these materials have exactly the same performance. Um, and finally, the, the topic of much uh, effort in development these days is the non-fluorinated polymer alternative. Um, wide range of materials that this encompasses, um, which includes polyurethanes, uh, acrylates, silicones, uh, wax dispersions, many structures like dendritic materials, and hybrids of these. Um, at Gore, we have uh, prop some proprietary rain room test methods. Um, as well, this is how we do our evaluations to down select materials. Um, in our rain rooms, these methods uh, mimic real raindrop size distribution and impact pressures. They, we can evaluate beating and, and, and measure water weight gain. Um, our modes uh, incorporate uh, many different stresses. So initial performance, we also looked at many different stress states and, and also regeneration. And uh, over the decade or so, we've developed this test method uh, it has connection to our field performance data. In terms of uh, field trials, um, it is a capability uh, that we have to place uh, materials uh, in a wide range uh, worldwide in different environments. Um, we treat these as um, we treat these as experiments, and we can design the level of control, or and even take jackets at different intervals back from the field and do uh, additional testing on that. Uh, we can target end uses. Uh, these are statistically relevant sample sizes we use to allow for generalization to a larger population. Um, and we put significant hours of wear. These are hundreds of hours of, air, of, air, of wear uh, over many months and can be uh, more than a year in some cases as well. Uh, and finally, um, also I want to make note the care and use contamination is also probed in these methods. And what we found is the durability of the water repellency can be affected uh, by various contaminations, such as uh, in the care of with wash detergents, as well as in use with things like sweat, semen, sebum, and the like. So let's look at some data here. Um, this is uh, our rain room lab evaluation. Um, and this is looking across uh, around 25 or 30 uh, different materials that we've uh, uh, evaluated. Um, and these are all non-fluorinated based uh, DWR polymers. Uh, in this plot, you'll see a water weight gain on the uh, y-axis and beating rating on the x. Highest performance would be towards the lower right-hand part of this chart. Um, and to give you some calibration, the beating uh, performance here uh, is a visual, uh, visual rating from 0 to 5, 5 being the highest. And anything less than three is uh, beginning to some degree of wet out. And as you'll see um, in our evaluations here, we have a wide range of performance uh, with the non-fluorinated uh, base materials, and I'm comparing them to uh, a high-performance uh, short-chain based uh, uh, polymer DWR. Um, additionally, you'll see there is some uh, slight measurable difference between our short-chain based material and uh, the non-fluorinated uh, materials that we've uh, evaluated. Um, but you'll see across that range, some materials have essentially no performance all the way to higher performing ones. And we use this method to down select further in terms of our evaluations and go into field trials. Um, also want to note, um, as I think this, uh, this group knows quite well and has been published uh, quite a bit and discussed, is these non-fluorinated uh, uh, materials do not provide any oil rating based on the AATCC. Uh, 118 test. So let's step through some of the development timeline um, that we set out in, in January 2017. And as you'll see, um, there's some initial uh, separated these out in terms of general outdoor and also in terms of specialized and these extreme extended uh, development uh, timeline. Uh, first, uh, we show here in light gray is the technology development. So these are developing the base materials uh, and coatings uh, that we have. Then we move into a product development phase and then into uh, commercialization. And as you see, this commercialization piece can be quite a long uh, process. Traditionally in the, in the um, outdoor industry, the timelines uh, can be between one and a half and two years. Um, and a large portion of that is basically engaging with our customers uh, and also uh, allowing them time uh, from their supply chains as well as um, creating their portfolio of products that they want to launch. 
Um, other things that are included in this is uh, commercialization, scale up, uh, production, uh, and overall shipment. Um, so let's focus on one aspect of this is the milestone that we put together on this uh, 2018 non-fluorinated based CWR shipment. Um, so let's drill down in terms of uh, what that development looked like. So here's a timeline of uh, our development of that. Um, it started actually back in mid-2012. Um, we did an initial landscape investigation of uh, what was the state of the art in terms of uh, knowledge for, for these various materials in terms of DWR polymers, um, basically doing our homework. Um, we launched a formal project around uh, 2013, um, evaluated these materials, down-selected, and put into our, uh, one of our first uh, field trials with these materials in comparison to, to <laughs> um, we completed that trial uh, in 2014 and benchmarked against uh, the performance that we had to, uh, at the time. Um, that field trial, uh, the uh, performance actually that we had was quite poor. Um, we had really strong feedback from our users uh, in terms of the performance level was not adequate or not fit for use for, these, for the applications that we, that we have for Cortex. Um, we went back. Um, we went back to um, the lab. Uh, there was significant development in, I'd say, 2014-2015 by many suppliers, uh, many uh, sort of a, uh, significant efforts in this space. Um, went back and did another round of evaluations of materials uh, in that time frame, and that's actually the data, uh, some of which is that data that I showed earlier. That went into a field trial um, after down selection. Um, during that field trial, we actually, uh, given that we were looking ahead to 2018, we started engaging with customers and we started to actually begin uh, some of the validation and, and uh, efforts in parallel, knowing that we were trying to hit this milestone of 2018. Um, during that evaluation and field trial, we also learned of some challenges that we had to address. Um, one was uh, some manufacturing aspects in terms of garment manufacturing. As you can envision, there's a lot of handling that occurs with that, and just, just hand oils uh, as well as sewing oils uh, had some impacts on this, and we had to address that. Um, and also, there were some quality concerns that we had in terms of the aesthetics and other details that are required for, um, uh, for DWR outside of water repellency. We did some reformulation, uh, started out in the second field trial, um, and completed that in, in 2018. Uh, ultimately, we launched this product uh, in a trade show in early 2018, um, and then uh, made it to retail in autumn winter 2018, meeting our meeting our timeline goal. Um, uh, and in terms of launch, the launch time of that, um, greater than 50% of our general outdoor volume um, has been transitioned and labeled uh, as such to recognize in the industry um, to allow people to follow our progress as well. Um, also want to note, uh, in parallel, we have recognized oh, there we, go. we have recognized that uh, the need for higher performing DWRs beyond this level of performance, um, and we have a parallel effort uh, going on in this area. Uh, and we recently completed a field trial um, focused in understanding this area more. Um, those materials, we still have some efforts uh, to do and some technical development. And we're looking at a um, uh, milestone goal that we put out uh, for towards the 2023 timeframe. So, uh, in conclusion, just want to thank you for the time and opportunity to present today. Um, I hope Joe and I have been able to convey about the passion we have for the products that uh, for the products we make, um, and our focus on the fitness for use, and also our commitment to con continue to improve. The environmental footprint of our products over the life cycle. Okay, I think uh, that will um, end things there for today. So, uh, just like to close by thanking uh, again both uh, Joe Carlin and, and John Hammersmith and also their colleagues from uh, Gore and being willing to um, put forward this uh, webinar and also some of my colleagues here, uh, Marianne and Laura, who helped organize um, the webinar and. Uh, 
so uh, great to have a large number of uh, participants um, on the call today and uh, continuing to uh, share these experiences uh, to help uh, everyone move to uh, safer alternatives uh, for PFASs. So uh, thanks, thank you um, uh, for sharing your experiences today.